checkered flag here across. Muller on the inside, and he's through. Reed tucks it behind. Ayello shuffled wide. Jason Play, this is me too. Max Bird, who is sideways and getting a contact with James Gordle, who gets airborne and sideswipes uh, Lewis Brown. And historic Patrick for Fortin and Luke Browning here at Alton Park. Round the outside is going to be a virtual dead heat between the two of them. Jordan Wynn has his nose in front. Here comes Gelzinis, who I think was just ahead. Gelzinis takes the place of the championship by 37 thousandths of a second. And Ben Green's going to take his first double win. The century team are delighted. Oh, and they're sideways, completely sideways. Gets it back together. Holds it. What a save by Plato. But Jones Cleland is attacking so much. He's up on two wheels. He attacks again as they go to the right hander and love him. And they both spin. They're both out. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode two of The Undercut. I'm Jake Sanson. He's Paul O'Neill. We've got a lot to talk about. Thruxton was absolutely epic. Have you dried out, Paul? Because it was pretty mental at the weekend. It was crazy. Do you know what? That's actually a very good question. And it's uh, it's good to to hear from you again, Jake. We um, When when we were pre-pandemic times, if it rained, I would be pee wet through. Um, because I'd be on and off the grid, running to the comms box. Mate, I didn't even know it was raining only because of what I've seen on my uh, on my comm screen. So I don't leave the we're not allowed to leave the compound and we don't leave the race truck and Steve Ryder's studio that sometimes I have to be running to. I didn't have to run to, I just walked. I opened my door and Steve's little seven and a half ton truck with the glass front on was there. So uh, yeah, so it was. It was rainy, mate, but tell you what, there was some money spent, or there will be some money spent fixing cars after that uh, colossal weekend, mate. But good to get going, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I mean, that must be really interesting, the first one of 2021, and obviously we're still under COVID. Everything's changed slightly, and I think we all got to see it. You know, we got to see the compound screens, and we got to see, you know, the sort of the the studio set up. It was quite different. What's it like being there compared to what it was like before? Um, well, I didn't ever. This is weird, mate. I never in my whole nine years previous ever spent time in the in the compound. Really? I never did. Because no, because I would either be in the comms box, which you know yourself from being in them, is the other end of the circuit or above a load of garages. The TV trucks are always on their own miles away. So you just pick the phone up or you talk on what's called talk back through your microphone and your, your, your in-ear monitors. You speak to who you need to speak to. So you don't actually, um, you don't actually need to be in the compound. Um, so, you know, for me, the years previous, I've always been either at the front of the grid or in the middle of the grid doing grid walks, talking about Twitter, getting people to send questions in. So I never had to go in the compound. So weirdly now, it's role reversals and I'm, I'm, I can't get out the compound, but just to answer your question as well, I've got to say ITV have been so, so good. Um, and some people may say draconian, the fact that we don't venture out the TV compound, but it's such a safe environment, what they provided. And, um, and yeah, it is a bit frustrating that we can't get out and see the cars properly and talk to the people and the drivers and the, the mechanics and everyone else. But yeah, I've, I've, it's been a good thing, man. Hopefully, as, as this starts to hopefully go away, we'll be able to, you know, be released into the wild, so to speak, because it does look <laughs> wild at the <laughs> uh, It's, it, it's going to be a brilliant season. And Thruxton gave us such a, a slice of what we can expect in 2021. Race one, uh, we got to see a brilliant podium. Josh Cook disappearing to the distance somewhat after that little bit of a love tap that got Ash Sutton spun around. And a second place finish for Tom Ingram. Great start for Accelerate Trade Price Cars. And Jake Hill third position in his first race as a manufacturer. I caught up with all three drivers at the end of the race as they came off the podium. Race one winner, 2021, Josh Cook. What a perfect way to start the year. Yeah, we needed that. Good qualifying, you know, we had a good day yesterday. Doesn't matter until you convert it. So really pleased to come out of the blocks, get a, get a win. Um, but, you know, we need to keep our head down. We need to keep working hard. It's a long season. Uh, we're here for the championship. We're not here for the one-off. So, yeah, luckily there was a, a win to be had in that race and we took it. We'll see what we can do in race two with Max Ballast. A lot of that race obviously came down to the start. It was a very close run between you and Ash Sutton and a really epic scrap. Yeah, it was a good battle. Um, obviously got two rear-wheel drive cars next to me. Ingram got off the line well. Um, I mean, it was fairly hectic, but yeah, just getting to those opening laps is super crucial. So took it a little bit conservatively, but um, managed to come out of it unscathed. Any more podiums and wins to come today, do you think? 
who knows, you know, we've got 75 kilos of ballast. Last time I did that, I think, was around here in 2018, and we, we had a good day. Um, but that means nothing, you know, the competition's super high. The pace of all the other cars and other drivers is, you know, quicker than it's ever been. So just got to get my head down. Got a lot of work to do on the car now to try and set it up for this success ballast, and we'll see where it goes from there. Good job, buddy. What a way to start the year. Cheers, thanks. Tom Ingram, second position. Fantastic start to the season. Great start. Yeah, really, really happy. It's obviously a good way to kick, kick it off. Yeah, straight with a straight with a straight with the podium. So, I mean, you could always say it was the perfect start. The perfect start would have been going one better and getting a win, obviously. But no, I, I'm really, really pleased with it. it. It's exactly what we needed to start it off with. And I don't want to get carried away with chasing chasing the silverware because what we need to be thinking about is the last round of the season. That's where we need to be thinking. So as boring as it sounds, we want to be scoring big points. We want to make sure we're there all year, not just a one-off. So yeah, as, as good a start it is, let's keep this momentum moving forwards. Nice to get the first race out of the way and prove that the Hyundai is as competitive, if not more so, than your Toyota was last year. Well, the thing is testament to Spencer having Spencer with me. Spencer was my engineer at Speedworks for, for, for many years. And, and Spencer and I get on fantastically well. We're best mates as much as, as, much as uh, a driver-engineer relationship. So from that side, it's perfect. And it just means that I've got that sort of comfort blanket in my ear, if you like, of knowing how Spencer works. Spencer can get the best out of me. I can get the best out of Spencer. And off the back of that, it means all the boys and girls who are working on the car trust everything that we're saying. And that's crucial. So from a setup point of view, yeah, it's great. We know where we need to go. We know what we need to do to improve. So yeah, spot on, very happy. And one of the key factors now, of course, is that we know how fast the car is without ballast. So as the season progresses, you could be competitive everywhere. Well, that's the plan, obviously. I mean, we, we, look, we're going to fill it full of pasties now and, and see how fast <laughs> we can uh, and see how fast we can get it. Obviously, it's going to be a it's going to be a big race for us now because there is a lot of weight going in it. Unfortunately, it will favour the rear-wheel drive cars more for the for, you know for the weight distribution of those guys. Like, let's let's see how again. I'm not being defeatist. I'm trying to be fairly realistic about it. But now I'm in a good place. Um, Look forward to it. Let's see what happens next. Good luck. Nice to see Jake. Jake Hill, third position. What a fantastic way to kick off the year and the leading manufacturer home as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, a fantastic result for me, MB Motorsport, accelerated by Blue Square and Motorbase. They've done a really great job with the car. And obviously, I've got my elbows out in the first couple of laps and we're there, third place. So, um, yeah, it was a, a great race-long battle also with uh, with Turkington. And, you know... He, he made a good move, good move on me, and I got him straight back. So, really pleased with myself, and obviously that meant we were we were top manufacturer as well. First time being a manufacturer driver, so yeah, over the moon. It's the ultimate start to the season, and it gives you guys plenty of confidence to build on from here. And you're going to be starting at the front later on, so perhaps there's even more. Possibly. I mean, obviously we're going to be heavy now, so the cars behind who weren't that much slower could creep forward and obviously just nip a couple of positions off us. But honestly, you know, if we can stay in sort of the top five, top six, bag the points, I'll still be pleased. But it must be satisfying to know that with no ballast, the car is fast and you're even faster. Yeah, exactly. You know, on, on the whole, I'm, I'm very happy and I know that the car is there and now we can have a look at the, the tyre data and car data and see what we need to do to improve. Epic job. Can't wait to see number two. Thank you very much. So there you go. Cookie with a victory. Ingram second and Jake Hill third. First talking point of the show then, uh, Paul. Let's talk about this. BTC Racing. What a start for them. Yeah, I mean, let's, Jake, let's talk about then what happened last year where the BTC uh, racing car, the main car, let's let's be honest, Josh Cook, had the worst start to the year. Um, so to tick off that first win in race one, um, I was really looking forward to the battle between him and Ash Sutton because one, they're good friends, but two, they properly go at it. Mm. And I've seen probably one of the best touring car races at Brands Hatch once when Cookie was in an Astra and... Um, and Ash was in, I think, the Lavorg, yeah. and they went across the line like milliseconds apart, and yeah. they give each other just about enough racing room. So I was looking forward to that. But when Colin made his little mistake and tapped him, I just knew in my heart of hearts that Cookie had it covered. He's he's the man. He's the man you want out front in your team, just lapping up the laps, getting them done and sorted. But I've got to say, Tom Ingram, I thought he was going to catch him and get to grips with him. He had like a a really good first phase of the race and then his car obviously is not massively as developed as as um as the honda fk80 so yeah cookie was able to uh stretch his legs wasn't he and um jake hill for me though my word that lad all them top 10 points finishes at the back end and last half of the year after having an awful time like josh did last year at the beginning of the season he took that on but in the top three you know um, and just amazing. And I know that Downforce Radio 
uh, do support him as well. So mm. great for you guys, us guys, and it's also good for, for Jake as well. So a bit of a dream weekend, really, mate. <laughs> it certainly was for them. What really stood out to me about Motorbase, though, is it wasn't just Jake that was on the pace. Ollie was on the pace as well, Ollie Jackson. So it really does seem like they've got a major package upgrade. That car looks absolutely planted. Yeah, can I just say, though, I didn't have... I've got Jake Hill down as being a competitor for the title. What I didn't have him and Motorbase down for, because the Ford has never been the best chassis consistently over the all the weekends, is I didn't expect it to go as well as it did round Thruxton. It's got a good mm-hmm. engine. Uh, we know that. But it's obviously got a, a, a chassis that, that I... I've, I've not kind of I've kind of overlooked it a bit I, because all the good chassis go well. People say it's a power circuit. It really isn't. It's a momentum circuit. Yeah. If you've got a hundred more horsepower in a terrible chassis, you're never going to do any good. So Motorbase and Jake and his engineers and Ollie Jackson and his engineer, they have done a mega job. And that car, momentum based with a good engine, is that is a strong package. Certainly is. We go now to uh, race two. We talk about it uh, in terms of the result, first of all, because obviously we'll talk about that other incident a bit later. Uh, Another victory for Josh Cook. He was really raking it in by that point. Stunning performance. Dan Kamish, what an excellent job in second position and another solid podium for Jake Hill. Once again, I caught up with all three as they came off the podium. Well, two races done, Josh. Race two, refer to race one. Um, yeah, it was it was good. Car was mega. Made some good changes to the ballast. It paid off. It did what we expected. Did what we, you know, learned in testing. So that's that's positive. Um, yeah, really pleased with that. I mean, a one-two for BTC Racing. Dan did a phenomenal job. Top bloke. Um, obviously, front row start for me. Two wins. Two fastest laps. Race three is going to be a bit tougher, starting from eleventh. But so far, it's been a good day. This car really has come fresh out of the blocks in the first round of the championship and is mighty. What is the secret that you guys have been able to unlock coming into this one? Quite enjoy the fact that, the, as it stands at the moment, the livery is quite similar, you know, uh, to, to, to previous years. You know, the colour scheme, we haven't come out with a fresh kind of look. But a lot has happened to the car underneath. Yeah. Um, a lot of development's gone in, a lot of hard hours, you know, from, from the whole team, you know, through, through what was a really really trying winter period on on many fronts so um to come out as we did shown our intent uh, i mean it's just a huge testament to the amount of work they put in so you know it's the first round of the year there's a long way to go but uh we couldn't have started it a better way sensational keep it up maybe you could even get a hat trick thank you cheers well at the end of race two dan camish second position it's like you've never been away i know i don't think i've been away about it I think, <laughs> not I think, technically technically no i've not missed a race yet so um no it was a great result great result for btc um you know very, very appreciative that they gave me a call and and hopefully that result shows why why i was the guy that got the call so um no a fantastic day so far fourth and a second josh is having a mega day he's been really good all weekend two wins for him and yeah i'm really proud to have played my my part in that in that um in that result you know one two um we were close there at the end and yeah i think anybody else i might have had a bit more of a go but it was the right result and um you know josh was driving fantastically the car's working very well and uh what a great result for, for btc racing it's amazing on social media early this week paul o'neill said he would rather defecate in his hands and clap than come into this with no testing how on earth have you managed to pull this out of the car and be this fast with no preparation yeah, I've not, you know, I've not driven a touring car since I parked it up at, uh, in November at uh, Brands GP, and even that was in the wet. So I haven't driven a dry lap in a long time. So, you know, when I got the call, I knew coming here the Honda does go well. It was always a matter of, you know, will it feel similar? You know, will will, will it be a very different car to what I was used to? Obviously, it's a different engine. It's different under the skin. And I wanted to make sure I was comfortable. You know, I'm quite relatively tall. You know, if you, if you, if you don't, if you don't, if it doesn't feel like it's yours, it's not easy to drive something fast. Certainly not around here where it's everything's on the edge um but the guys at btc have gone above and beyond to make sure i'm comfortable they've welcomed me and they give me every opportunity and, and the results showed you know we've had fourth and a second with absolutely not a single lap of testing really in, in the dry so um yeah really pleased and uh yeah i think it's a good string in my bow that shows that i can turn up and do a good job which uh, which has to do me some credit i doubt you're going to want to get out of this car now because you're obviously right at the front end <laughs> maybe the rest of the season you'll be there uh, you know 30, that's my 30 second podium and it might be my last for a little while in touring cars but it will be the last to me fantastic we're very good job thank you two races two podiums jake hill is there going to be a third one now 
Um, it's going to be very hard to do, Jay. You know, it's um, it's a real, real challenge to come from that far back to stick it on the on the podium. However, we did it from seventh, you know. So um, there's every chance that if we hook it all up right, we can at least move a lot further up from where we are. In a way, it was a shame the race was red flagged because that first start was absolutely mighty. Yeah, in some ways, I, I may I may have had a second, you know, but. Um, regardless i'm still happy you know our, our, the car was so much better i was able to really stay in touch with the with the two hondas in front so pleased and obviously now we go into the third race there is a bit of ballast to take into it but there's obviously a lot of unknowns as well so the third race is always the most mysterious perhaps yeah i mean the, we we're actually carrying the same weight so that's no change so race two so race three the car won't change you know so um yeah really really happy with with how the car's handling and yeah, race three always brings up a surprise, doesn't it? So uh, we'll just wait and see what it does. Well, good luck with it. Hopefully it's another good one. Thank you, guys. So Josh Cook, two from two. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that to start the season. Dan Camish, though, can I just pick this up? A few days before Thruxton, he didn't have a drive. He was confirmed very late to get into that BTC racing Honda. What a mega job. And you were quoted as saying on Twitter, Paul, you said, and I'm going to quote this for you word for word, you said you'd rather cack in your hands and clap than drive around Thruxton without testing. That's what you said. That is an amazing run from Dan Camish. Yeah, Dan Camish, shown his credentials before. One of the best drivers out there. He's gone up against one of the other best drivers out there in Cookie. Um, to do what Dan Camish done the weekend just passed, is nothing short of phenomenal. I know he knows the car, but it's not his original car. It's a Mm. BTC car. It's got a different power plant. So he's had to think on his feet. He's had to learn. The conditions were changeable. He's not driven a touring car for months, six months, I think. Um, You know, a lot was different around him. He's come in and he's done an absolute pro job. And, And actually, we don't know this yet, whether Cookie was super fast in that second race. He obviously was because he won, but Kamish would have had a chance to look at him with the weight difference. So has Kamish been told to back off and done the job he <laughs> supposed to do as a pro, or was Cookie that fast? I think it's a bit of both. I think Kamish was probably on the limit trying to keep up with Cookie, even though the weight was different. I mean, it's the first time for a while that we've run full ballast at 75 kilos and Tim Harvey was telling me in comms, he was like, mate, 75 kilos, there's no way race one winner's going to win race two. So, and I kind of went with him with it because you think the tyre deck will be horrendous. So amazing for BTC. They put a lot of time and effort. Um, they've had a lot of cloud over them with Creasy, um, not you know, not not turning up for the start of the season because the deal fell through. So Kamish was a great replacement. Who else but Kamish? That's what Tim said to me, and I've got to agree with him. Did the job, didn't he? I mean... If Cookie wins this title, a lot of it will be down to how Camish treated him at uh, at Thruxton. It's a very, very solid point. Uh, we should obviously, because it's race two, talk about that incident. Some pictures have now emerged from Alex Wood of JEP uh, on social media. Jade Edwards, Andy Neat and Glyn Getty. It was a monster shunt. I was actually stood at turn one uh, as the field came by and it was horrific the noise that was made it was literally like a car being ripped in half uh, in terms of sound it was it was absolutely monstrous i mean thank goodness all three of them are okay interesting the aftermath of that what's your take of everything related to that paul so i've i've kind of been across it but i think there's a few things to say and i know our good friend George Grant was was watching as well, and he said it was the worst thing and hear the noise and the, and the vision of that car going up mm. in the air. Uh, it didn't scale the barriers, and the barriers did brilliantly at Thruxton. Yeah, they did. And the safety crew were amazing. The things to take away from it, Jake, I think, and this is me being, you know, uh, just saying how I think I've seen it, is that, you know, people saying you don't break for that first corner. Well, you do if you're at the back of the grid. You know, those cars were the, the majority were at the back of the grid. So you've got a good run up to turn one, which is a lift in in a with a car with hot tyres on. Remember, these cars don't have tyre warmers. They have cold rears. So the first few rows, they're just, they go, and they're probably only pulling fourth gear by the time they're driving around. And you'd be flat out, absolutely pinned. The other guys who were involved in the accident, they would have been approaching that in fifth gear, I would have thought. Um, 
and it's it's either a lift or a break or both you know so it doesn't matter what the person does in front of you, you can't really blame them it's like an accident on the motorway you know if someone's braking you've got to react and i think what's happened is and this might be completely um not what happened but what i'm going to say is hear me out jade edwards is on the outside of andy needs turning into that first corner now forget about the uh, the issues that Jade and Andy have had in the past, we got to realise is that Andy Neat is is racing Jade Edwards for the Jack Sears. So that car, it doesn't matter who it is, but if it's someone that's directly you're competing with, you're going to be looking at that car a long time thinking, I can't have her or him come around the outside of me because that's it then, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stuffed. Mm. I think he's maybe misjudged it because he's been looking to the left. He's looked up and he's noticed that Glenn in front in the Cupra has braked. He's backed out. Yeah, he's gone to brake. And he said that there was brake failure, which has gone down like an absolute lead balloon because it's now been confirmed that it wasn't brake failure. But hear me out on this one. I think what's happened is, because I think I've seen him comment, comment on it, or maybe his wife, Natalie, he's a left foot breaker. And I think he has made an absolute f up if i'm allowed to say that <laughs> and i think he is actually left foot braked onto the clutch right and i have done that once before and i'm not defending andy Nick. i do i don't even know him that well i don't i don't really care about him but what i'm saying is there's two sides to a story here and i think he has made a mistake and if that is correct and that much damage that's been caused he's been given a two thousand pound fine points on his license and I think a grid penalty I think I've not quite looked properly at it but anyway he's had big penalties and if you think he's got enough money to pay £20,000 whatever it doesn't matter there's an accident there that's caused loads of damage and it's a nightmare but what it does say is there was no sign of a mechanical failure so Andy Neat needs to come out for his own sanity and for the team and, and, and hopefully tell us exactly what's happened and gone do you know what I've actually made a bit of a mistake here and this mm. is what happened. And I didn't realise because if you hit a clutch, you know what it's like. If you hit a clutch, it's like, it, it's like it's exactly the same as having brake failure. I've, I've had it. <laughs> I've had brake failure and I've hit a clutch by accident instead of braking. I mean, these are top line BTCC drivers. Should they be doing it? Not really, but still things happen. Mistakes happen. But it does, I need to ask the question to see if they've been given the data because there'll be a clutch potentiometer on the car so they will know if the clutch has been hit instead of the brake and if the brake has not been hit because there's potentiometers on them so they know what angle the, the pedals are at so that's what we need to see um and I, you know jade what a classy tweet did you see that jade jade edwards's tweet i did see her tweet yeah amazing typical jade i don't expect anything different from her just you know guys just give andy a bit of a break here he said he's had a mechanical fault you know, and that's what we have to go with. So fair play to her. Everybody was okay, but that could have been a lot worse. And Glyn Getty, team hard, cars destroyed. Jade's car, engine as well, apparently. So big money. And I mean, like, I think that was, I think it's like the cost of a terraced house where I live. To fix that. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. I, I actually managed to grab a quick word with Jade Edwards after that accident uh, when she was back uh, in the paddock. So let's see what she had to say about it all. At the side of the track after race two here at Thruxton, Jade Edwards is with me. Jade, obviously a big accident. What happened? I don't really know, to be honest. I was a, a bit of a passenger in that. So I've uh, gone around the outside of, of turn one, gave Glyn Getty, who I thought was on my inside, or I think was on my inside, a nice amount of room. And then there just was a huge impact on my on, on the rear. And it took us all into the barriers. And I think Glyn went over the top of me at one stage and landed on his roof. But uh, Andy has told us that his throttle was stuck open. For some reason, he couldn't slow down the car. So we've all had a chat. We've all kind of, you know, there's no anger there. Um, It just seems to be one of those things, unfortunately. Obviously, the damage looked pretty horrendous, but from what we gather, it looks as though it could even be repairable in time for race three. Yeah, I think Glyn's is too far gone, to be honest. He had uh, damage at all corners, but mine's predominantly front end. So a lot of that stuff is removable and, uh, and attachable with new stuff. So I'm hoping the boys will get it out. And if, if anyone can, BTC Racing are definitely those people. Well, they're definitely doing a good job at the moment with two wins and uh, three podiums combined. And obviously, we know that you have the car to be up there because of how fast you were yesterday. Yeah, I feel like I'm letting the side down a little bit. 
bit at the moment. But um, yeah, it's a learning curve for me. These boys are up front proving what the car can do. And I've just got to try and hit the ground running in race three and take that knowledge onto Snetterton in, in five weeks time. Great to see you're OK. Good luck for this afternoon. Thank you. Cheers. So there you go. And lo and behold, the team were actually able to get her out for race three. Phenomenal. I have to say that any car could get back out after an incident like that one. It was a big hit from all three. I mean, obviously, Glyn and Andy out on the spot. Amazing work from BTC to get Jade back out there. I I know exactly what you're saying about this incident with Andy. And it really does. It really pains me to see so much aggression and criticism towards a racing driver for getting it wrong. You know, I I know Andy quite well, and I've had many, many conversations with him. You've got to take into account that this is a guy who shouldn't even be in a racing car in terms of his massive accident in Brick Car in 2009. He had a broken neck. He was in hospital for many, many weeks. It's a miracle the guy is even driving now, and he's doing as stellar an effort as any other driver is to be even on that grid. It's difficult because we can judge sat here not being in those cars, not racing them. But it is very, very difficult to look at it from what it is, especially considering some of the incidents that have happened before. Do people need to take a pinch of salt and kind of go, look, you guys aren't racing drivers. You you can't really judge what's going on in the heat of that moment. Can I, can I tell you something? I I actually am glad I don't race anymore at that level. Yeah. Because I would not want the stuff that I see, not just Andy Nee, Turkington got a battering on Twitter as well, saying that BMW and, and Turkington are in Gow's pocket. Let's see what they do. Well, let's see what you can do. Got <laughs> Absolute a 17, baloney. 17 second penalty. It's too easy to criticize. And I've done it myself. <sighs> it's a difficult one. But, you know, all this be kind and, you know, don't be this and don't be that. Mm. it's so easy to say and just go off and not do it. And I understand why people get aggrieved because touring cars now, and this never used to be the case, Jake, it's very much like football. It's tribal, mate. It is. It's tribal. And, you know, I've heard some horrific things from Matt Neal and Jason Plato about what's happened to, to them on the way into circuits. And and this is this is 0.0001% because... I know most of the fans and they are mint. Like, yeah, they are. they are the best people. You know them as well, mate. But yeah. there are people out there who just go out of their way just to be horrible. And I am not defending Andy Neat. I'm not defending him. I don't even, I've known him for years as in I've raced against him. I don't know him. I don't know him nothing. I owe him nothing. But what I have to do in the media is say, this could have happened and that could have happened. Make your own decision, but you don't have to go at someone like that. He's got a young no. son who's reading carts. It, that's not nice because no one knows his son and he doesn't need that. But I can see why people go at him because he shouldn't go on about a driver's past or whatever, but he has had some incidents. Um, like he got he got excluded from all three rounds at Thruxton and that's going to throw fuel on the fire. But for me, it just, just don't do it, man. You know, it's like there's no need to be that horrible and it's too easy to do that. And, and I'm only trying to, you know, people will see this now and they'll be like, oh, how can someone hit the clutch? And I'm just saying that's what can happen. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, so fingers crossed, Andy can come out and, and spread more light on it. Because you know what people like, especially me, especially commentators and pundits, they like it when you come out and go, do you know what? I actually did make a mistake. It, mm. it, and it's this and it's that. And I shouldn't have said this about the mechanics. So yeah, this is all hearsay. And it's all wives and people and family talking and, and saying stuff on the internet it's only the bits i've picked off so i do hope that um yeah it's it's all sorted and then um, i must admit though in testing and i do think andy's going to be a lot better than he than he was last year i know what you mean thrown quite a lot of um thrown quite a lot of testing at it um whereas jakey's teammates not had too much testing but andy has had a lot of testing and he and fair play if you've got the money to do that He's been looking fast, if I'm really yeah. honest. So see how he gets on anyway. Absolutely. I mean, the timesheets don't lie, do they? I mean, the moral of this story essentially is, guys, uh, you're listening. We know you love the British Touring Cars as much as we do. Just be kind. It really doesn't make any difference. 
it doesn't change anything and it actually says more about you guys than it does about the driver so just be kind and just enjoy the sport for what it is race three uh what a phenomenal race that's one of the best british touring car races i have seen for a long long time that race could have had about seven different winners at one stage it was such an incredible classic vintage touring car race it ended up being ash sutton he got the victory after an amazing fight back a brilliant run to the line between Jason Plato and Jake Hill. What a way to end the weekend. That's exactly what we wanted. I managed to grab all three of them off the podium. So after an incredible race three, Ash Sutton is with me, race three winner. Ash, brilliant comeback drive. Uh, tell us about how it all unfolded. Yeah, it was uh, an interesting day to be fair, but obviously it's great to get the, the race three win. Something I feel like we deserve in race one and two, but obviously the conditions really threw threw it up in the air in that last one obviously we we started the race from wet you hear about the guys on the slicks but you're just waiting for that radio call to come in halfway through and it's like all oh, right here they come but luckily the heavens opened and, and we managed to claw our way back through the first two races it looked like everything could have been a bit of a nightmare this weekend but pulling it back in the third race what does that bring back to the confidence it's good it, it just it pulls us a little bit more into the championship again um and ultimately we leave here knowing the full potential of what we can achieve and we go into set with our heads high. And the thing is, Snetterton is a great circuit for you. You have a good history there. So this is a really good opportunity for you guys to ride the crest of that wave. Yeah, it's been, it, it's always played its cards right to me, shall we say. But whether it's a real drive track, I don't know. But we're for sure going to turn up with a better car than what we had last year. Fantastic job. Here's to the next one. Good luck. Okay, thank you. JP, P2 in race 602 in the British Touring Car Championship. Welcome back to the big show. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I enjoyed that. It was, uh, you know, I love it when the conditions are tricky, and um, you know, every corner the, the conditions change, and you need know, to keep thinking and trying to find the ultimate li limit. But it, it kind of, you know, our pre-race plan worked out. It's always a, a bit of a guess what the weather's going to do, but we guessed right. We knew it was going to rain, and then we knew it would dry up a bit, and then there's a very good chance it would come back to us. So I elected just to look after my tyres and be gentle on the wet, so the opening part. And then as it started to dry, then to really just look after them, hoping it would come back in the end, which, which it did. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with our weekend's work. I mean, I'm a bit pissed off with, with, uh, with Cook, because <laughs> he had no right to be involved in what he was doing. Right. And that's OK. You know, when your ego's up like his is, then you, then you make some shit cho choices. But what he did when he could have been past Hill going into church and uh, decided not to and then just jumped on the brakes he screwed me up. Not so good. It's fine, because I've got, not only have I got a nose like an elephant, I've got a memory like one. <laughs> and he'd get it back. The car is clearly rapid and you guys have done a fantastic job in terms of setup this weekend to bring it back at the end of the weekend. There could be some really brilliant chances for some victories over the course of the year if things keep accelerating as they are. Well, to be honest, that's why we're here. We're not here to make the numbers up. Um, yeah, I think, you know what? I think we've got some work to do, for sure. We're not quick enough yet. I think in conditions like this, then we are, obviously. But I think in a straight scrap with um, some of the other cars in, in slicks, we've got some work to do. We're, we're, a bit low on, we're a bit low in straight line speed, and that was evident to see the way that um, Robottom just pissed past me. I mean, 20 car lengths he pulled in a straight line so that's frustrating it's probably not frustrating for you guys but when you're in the car <laughs> it's yeah, frustrating absolutely because you can't do anything about that but if he can do that behind me then every time he's opening the throttle he's, get, he's pulling lap time so we, we've got some and I'm not suggesting it's the fault of Swindon or anything like that but as an engine installation package either they've got to raise the game we have um or a combination of everything, we're not fast enough in a straight line. And we've got to cure that, otherwise it's, that's going to be tough. But you've got Snetterton and Brantach coming up, two circuits that have always been very kind to you in the past, so this is a good grounding point to move you forward. Uh, yeah, do you know what? We're, we're, we're in a good shape. We're in good shape. You know, everyone's smiling. My sex van will still be on, because obviously that stays on until I win. <laughs> but I'll negotiate hard when I get back. I'll try and pull out, you know... All of the, all of my best, my best moves. Um, <laughs> but no, well, I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, Snetterton should be good for us. It's a, it's a chassis circuit, it's, uh, probably more so than it is an engine circuit. Um, 
So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, for the sake of your machismo, here's a bit to the wind <laughs> and Good luck. But, but honest to God, that's a true thing. That, <laughs> I made a deal with Mike years ago. I said, look, put me on the sex brand and only lift here if I win on race weekends. And uh, it's on. It's on. <laughs> Good luck for it. I'll try my best. It'll be a no, though. <laughs> Three races, Jake Hill, three podiums, and I'm going to let this moment sink in. You are leading the British Touring Car Championship. How does that feel? Absolutely unreal. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just crazy, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm over the moon. I definitely did not think this was possible, you know. I knew we could be up there 100% and score a podium like we did in race one. But to actually come away with three thirds and leading the British Touring Car Championship is absolutely unreal. What does this mean now for the potential for the season? Because you know that the speed is there, you know consistency can be achievable. Is there a title fight on now? Oh, there always was, you know, so in my eyes there always was. Uh, that is the aim this year. So it just, um, I'm just so happy that this year has proven, or this first round has proven to, you know, proven to know that we, we can do this. You know, it is possible. And yes, all right, you need a bit of luck. And we've had, a, we had three brilliant races here at Thruxton. And we, one day we will have a bad one. It happens, but... As a start, couldn't be happier. And there's a lot of tracks coming that are very strong for you indeed. The car seems good, even with ballast, even yeah. with difficulties. You really do seem to have a winning formula at the moment. Yeah, let's hope so. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be hard qualifying the car with 75 kilos at snap, especially as it's such a long lap. So, you know, it hurts more almost. But, you know, I'm confident we can work our way around it and let's just have a solid weekend at snap as well. Amazing job, buddy. You're the British Touring Car Championship leader. Enjoy the moment. Thank you very much. So there's a lot to unpick from this race. First of all, Ash Sutton, his victory. There's two points I want to make. Uh, the first of which is that that just shows how unlucky he was in race one and two. That car could have won at least twice, maybe even three times the way things went down over the course of the weekend. Uh, he genuinely had a chance to prove that, you know, he could have left Thruxton as the championship leader. It would have been very easy. The second thing, that's worth uh, unpicking from that is that how on earth did Ash Sutton manage those tires in the third race? Because when it was dry, lots of drivers who were on the wets were complaining that they were completely shot by the end of the race. Sutton looked after those tires beautifully. Yeah. And you know, it's a very good point. So we're talking about Ash Sutton here, who was fired off the, f <laughs> the first time he turned right, he was out the out of contention. So this guy's out of contention and probably at the back of the grid trying to rejoin. He's now 10 points off and fourth in the championship. Fourth in the championship. How's he done that? He come back through the pack and he worked his way up, like Tim Harvey said in commentary, back into contention in race two to get the reverse for three. And that's that's exactly what he did. Um, to, what would have been, you know, is that, Jake, is that ominous for every other driver on the grid to see what he's done. You know, I would be there as Josh Cook or whatever and go, well, we had a good weekend, but I can kind of see what we're going to have for the rest of the year. Yeah. The, to answer your other question, how did he manage those tyres? Two things to this. One, it's Ash Sutton. And yeah. two, that, that car is so good in the wet because it is so compliant and soft and um, just just amazing on its dampers and springs and roll bars. It, mm. They brought it to a T and that was perfect conditions for Ashley Sutton. I do genuinely think, and this is a tough, this is a tough comment to make, but of all of those drivers on the grid, I genuinely do believe that Ash Sutton is probably pound for pound, the best raw natural talent that's on that grid. What he can drag out of a car week in, week out, is just exceptional. And he doesn't just do it with touring cars. He can do it with anything. He can put, you put him in a GT, he'll be at the front. You put him in a TCR, he'll be at the front. You put him in a gearbox card. He proved it at the end of 2019. He'll be at the front. It's just phenomenal what he can do in a racing car. And I think you're right. I think it actually bodes very well for him and not very well for everybody else. Because if that's what he can pull out of the bag, you know, I watched him go through the field in race two and it was like some of the other cars out there were just standing still. The thing is with Ash, so I'll take you back to, to a, just when Ash come onto the scene in the MG with Josh Cook, he he, he caught my attention and he, and I knew he'd going to win a race in, in that car and it wasn't the best car in the world. And he won in the wet at Croft, but that's a standout achievement in a bad car. And 
But at the time, it was okay, actually. It was not a bad car. It was run by AAA. But he just showed me something. And I remember him driving into the side of Colin Turkington in the Lavorg, which he would then win the championship in the next year. And I remember thinking, as soon as he bounced off him into the hairpin, I thought, he's a bit cheeky, isn't he? He's showing his elbows a bit here. And then as he drove on into the distance, I thought, that is a wake-up call for all these drivers. But the thing is, I remember when Ash was around then, and Colin Turkington was at the top of his game. And I always said that Colin Turkington is a good 4 or 5% better than any other driver on the grid. That is my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's swung ground and Ash is a good 5 6 7% better than, than a lot of the drivers on the grid. And I think mm-hmm. the people, your Cooks and your Hills... Um, you know, and and Colin are, are just about hanging on, but the but the rest of them against Ash are, are just a percentage off, and he's that good. I'm so glad I don't race now against him. I just <laughs> I tell you what, mate, I, I would be out of breath trying to keep up with that lad. And that's you know, I wasn't the best driver in the world, but I could pedal on my day, and he makes me sick how fast he is. <laughs> I, I, do, do you know? I, and you'll know this being a, a, a British racer in multiple different formulas of car. You weren't just touring cars; you did a lot of other things as well. I think I know where a lot of Sutton's natural craft comes from, and it's his Formula V days. You and I both know that old school Formula V and Formula Ford, that is where you get the natural raw race talent from. Yeah, definitely. You know, a lot of the people that come from, and it was a really good, um, it was a really good interview. I think it was Louise or David Addison had done an interview with him on the telly, and and he was talking about his early days. And this is what offends me about, about racing in general is that there's there's hundreds of Ash Suttons out there who will never get the chance. I'm not saying that's, you know, Ash is lucky, but Ash was, you know, picked up. And I just wish more youngsters like Ash would be picked up in the championships that don't even run slicks because they, they don't have it. They don't afford it. It can't be afforded in the regs. There's so many good kids in Mazda MX-5 Super Cup who could be the next Ash Sutton, yep. you know, in fiestas and 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 uh, and the Saxo Junior drivers who are at the top of the game at the minute, they, unfortunately, we'll probably never see what they're all about. Some we will, and that's that's motorsport at the end of the day. But Ash should be looked upon by all these young kids. Who Ash actually helps a lot of juniors. I don't know anyone else except for Phil Blue who helps out uh, these junior drivers as well as he does. Everybody who wants to race a British touring car or a GT car should watch and look how he's progressed himself and put him on top of that platform. Because he's he's not just a champion, he's actually a proper good lad as well. And yeah, I absolutely love that right. Ash, so. and, and, and he does love a good KFC after a race meeting. How do I know that? Evidence on the way back from Thruxton. I, I'm just there grabbing a the water. In he comes, happy as brass. Nice KFC with the missus. Excellent. Well done, Ash Sutton. Breakfast of champions, eh? Um, Jason Plato, I want to get on to Jason because he crept into the weekend right towards the bitter end with the Vauxhall. And race three looked to me like we saw a bit of the old Jason Plato fire coming back. He was motivated. The car was grippy. He was able to get back to his best. But even in race one, race two, there was a little hint that I think Plato's year off has actually done him a lot of good. Now, before anybody jumps down the throat and thinks, well, hang on, what about the qualifying error? What about that mess up holding up Jake Hill? That's interesting. I want to see if we can unravel some of the negatives and the positives of Jason. But it certainly looks as though we've got the old Jason back. I would say so. And I think Tim summed it up perfectly. And you, you've you said it as well, is that I think that year off has done him the world of good. He sat back. He's took stock. He's... Fire was always burning, but I think it was just getting starved of oxygen. Um, you live it and breathe it too much sometimes. And I remember in 11 when I finished, I'd had enough. I couldn't be asked with it, if I'm honest and sorry to swear. But the other thing is, is when I come back to do one-off, ra- one-off rounds, I was just so fired up because I'd missed it so much. And I, and I knew that that's what I, I was living for. Mm-hmm. I think that Jason, to be fair, is exactly like that. Um but what he did say in an interview was he cut the team and him came with a game plan and their game plan without him saying was finishing the top six and see if we can get a podium at the end. Probably what they've done is add that they've had a sixth 
They've had a fifth, and then he had that run to the line with Jake. And, you know, I heard ITV in my ears actually saying, oh, that run to the line with Jake, we need a replay on it. You know, they're all, because it's Jason, they're always after some kind of ulterior motive to why he's had a, a panel bash with someone. Mm-hmm. And what it was was, that's just a racing driver unwinding the lock, one to just go across the front of someone else, but there's no malicious in it, no, no, no malice in it. He's just trying to get across the line first. But Jason feeds... The thing is with Jason, for me, if it's all boring and nothing's really happening, he he hasn't got anything to keep his fire going. But what he will do is he'll swear in a media event, on a media event, or he'll he'll rub someone up the wrong way because he loves all that, because it gets him going. It's like, you know, when someone starts a fight with you, like when I was a kid, someone, they'd push you first. They wouldn't just punch you. They yeah. push you first to get a reaction. And that's Jason. And that's why he's loved because he is Mr. BTCC and he will get that hundredth win for sure, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he will. And do you know what? He actually reminds me a lot of Anthony Reid in the sense that the two of them are absolute peas in a pod. They just know no other speed other than flat out on the limit dicing with a crash. That is literally, they are teetering on the edge every time they're out there. And that's what we love. It's that showmanship. It's that incredible style that both of them have. Uh, and Anthony was beloved by the British Touring Car fans for the same thing. What really interested me about Jason post-race there, we heard it in the interview, he was already starting to talk about, you know, his irritation with uh, Swindon, engines, you know, all these sort of little tiny things that he's got a little bit of a grievance about. He wants to win another title and he genuinely thinks this could be the year to do it. Yeah, you know, and I'm fully with you. But he, you know, he, the thing is with Jason, because he's got such a media presence, if he says something about a Swindon engine or he says something about the car or <laughs> the control tyre or the control parts that go on the car, he knows that will get back to somebody. So he doesn't really need to do anything else about it. Mm. They will make sure that it doesn't, it isn't a problem for him. Um, and he's a He's a very clever man and a very determined man. But Jason said to me years ago, because I said, you're not disappointed with being, you know, known as a two-time champion at the minute as everyone's flying off to do three and fours. And he's like, not really, mate, because my sponsors need me to fight at the front and win races. If I get another championship, that's fine. But if I'm up the front, that's all that matters. If I'm there at the end of the day, that's all that matters for my profile. And, you know, and and I've got to go with him on that. That's how he operates and that's how he makes a living. So he needs to, you know, be out there and make sure he needs the media with him because as soon as something happens, everybody wants to know about it. And that is how you operate as a professional driver, like it, like he says in his book. Yeah, his book was an absolutely fabulous read. And I got to learn a lot about him that I didn't know, actually. But I had a fabulous interview with him. It's on our archive somewhere. Our, our listeners may well have heard it again. Um where he talked about, you know, I asked him, you know, has the world championship never appealed to you? And he said, well, if I was 20 years younger, it probably would have done. The lifestyle would have been cool. But, you know, it would have been suicidal for me, he said, to be a world touring car driver because the marketing is nothing. I mean, people didn't know who Andy Prio was when he was winning the world championship, which was a crime, essentially, as far as I can see. But, you know, he's such a shrewd operator. He knows exactly what he wants and he knows exactly how he's going to get it. And he has become such a figure of power in the British Touring Car Championship as an individual driver that you're absolutely right. He can drop a comment out there and just by saying it, it will enact change. There are certain drivers on that field who would never dare to say something along those lines. They'd never dare to poke fun at these things. But Jason can say it and it will always benefit him in the long run. It's so clever. Very clever. And it's just, he's been around for a long time. He knows what floats people's boats, you know, a Van Muller's come and gone, arguably an amazingly good driver against Jason. But, you know, you look at what a Van's achieved and he's in world touring cars. I didn't even know he was still racing. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Great Britain and I know what Jason's doing, but he's dead right. He, you know, he knows how to make money and he knows how to win races and he knows how to get a team around him. And with, and with Power Max. He's got a good team and Weaver believes in him, Adam, the, the team owner, team principal. So, yeah, he you know he knows exactly what he's doing. And the shame of it is Matt Neal's not there for him to knock 10 bells out of. 
mm. you know, and vice versa. And it was the same last year. I found that, do you know when like, this is a horrible thing to say, but you know when like an, an old an old person loses the partner? It was a bit like that last year. Yeah, <laughs> and Matt I know what you like, mean. Kind of like driving around and he, I, he obviously wanted to do it, but he what? It was as if he'd lost a bit of a bit of a foe and a friend in the same sentence, mm. and and hopefully, Matt. Uh, sorry, Jason doesn't doesn't feel that this year, but he doesn't look like it because he's right up the front. No, I, I I agree with you. I don't think he's going to notice that Matt's not there because he's too busy getting fired up. What was interesting this weekend, and I do want to pick it up a little bit, was that team dynamics were rather conspicuous by their absence, uh, far too often over the course of the weekend. And they there were times when we saw flashes of brilliance from Flash uh, and from Robottom. It was good to see them getting in there when they had the opportunity, but something just doesn't quite seem right about that car and those two. They haven't quite gelled with it yet. I mean, it's two two new drivers to the cars, really. I know Gordon's got masses of talent and masses of experience, but... Mm. You know, he's driving an FK8. He's been fast in testing, though, you know, on like, I mean, fast and people, he's been under the radar. But I think there was two things there. I think one, they were qualified out of position because you've seen how fast Robo was in one of the races. Uh, mm. I forget which one it was now. He was, I think it was oh, race two. two. He was fourth in race two and he did a couple of outside, round the outside job. He's on a few people. Yeah, and he the did. Car looked, the car looked alive. Gordon was carrying a problem after his race one accident. We know that. And then race three was a bit of a lottery. So I will, I'm will. i going to stick my neck on the line here to a point. And I'm going to say when we get to Snetterton, Sheds is not going to have a lot of weight, if any. He's 11th in the championship. So he's yeah. going to be proper fast. And I reckon you're going to see a front row of, of one of those cars. So... I'm with you. I just think it was cloudy and the water was muddied by by the conditions and the qualifying and the and the accident sheds out as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely hope you're right because it would be fantastic to see them fighting tooth and nail again. Uh, another interesting driver I want to pick up on from the weekend, Rory Butcher. Now, don't get me wrong; he did not get what he deserved out of that weekend, but I'm going to do very similar to you. I'm going to stick my neck out on the line here. I think Butcher could mount a title attack because his speed and what that car has been able to do fresh out of the blocks, right from race one, Rory was a genuine threat. Mm, and I think a lot of that is what you've, this is a really interesting dynamic, this, because you've got Rory who's come from a kind of predominantly well-balanced Ford Focus into a lurry like rear endy uh Toyota that Tom Ingram has left to go to the opposite kind of car, which he has engineered brilliantly with his engineer Spenner and and mm. Spenny and um and Accelerate. So yeah, I am I was very impressed with Rory, but a lot of Thruxton is, you know, you can have an 80%, you can have 80% in a car, but the rest of it is you, you know. So uh, there's a bigger percentage delta or difference when you go to other circuits so i think you're right in the fact that butcher will he will come alive and there is no doubt he'll win races as he really gets up to speed with that car i think they've been sandbagging quite a lot in testing um but it'd be interesting to see how they get on at uh, snetterton because that's the first i think that car had its first win didn't it with tom ingram had two wins that day i think the corolla uh, a couple of years ago when it first came out it's first time it looked fast so yeah i think it's Rory adapting to the car and the and the team adapting to Rory. So yeah, the, he did a great job, and it was unfortunate that that shunt he had. I still don't know if he got tapped or it was a cold right rear in race two. But um, but yeah, I think he is definitely one to watch, mate. Yeah, could be very interesting. The one final thing I'm going to pick up on: we managed to catch up with the Jack Sears winner uh, from the weekend, Sam Osborne. I managed to grab him at the end of a very hectic race three. What a phenomenal day at the office. Sam Osborne, brilliant performance and the Jack Sears Trophy winner for the first round of the season. How does that sound? Uh, that sounds pretty damn amazing to me, to be honest. I mean, consistency was key for us. I didn't think we were going to get it back today. Uh, today. I didn't think it was going to get it back from Dan today but because he's driven absolutely amazingly. But I mean, I think he got up to like fourth, didn't he, in the last race? 
Um, so, but yeah, consistency is key. And fingers crossed, hopefully we'll we'll get there. So yeah, it's a great start for the entire operation, the entire new uh, motor base. Maybe this is the start of something particularly nice for you this season. Yeah, fingers crossed. Hopefully we can carry it on. Um, we've we've got to work on a bit of our uh, techniques in a few places, but we're getting there. So fingers crossed. Hopefully it'll be a good year. Great job. Well done, buddy. So, yeah, very deserving moment for Sam Osborne, one of those very hard workers who has a lot of misfortune, but he was able to ride the lottery in race three. He thought his weekend was done. He genuinely didn't think he was going to get the Jack Sears that weekend. So I think perhaps a sense of relief, but also that kind of confidence, that kind of motivation. Now that he's got that, we could see another Sam Osborne. We could see something uh, very special from him in the races to come. Yeah, I seen a lovely picture of actually. Um, I think it was on our com cam, I think, uh, or, or our camera that shows um, where Louise is in the garage. There was a lovely picture of Jake Hill talking to Sam, um, and they both had their trophies. And um, I was like, "Oh, that's wicked!" That because I know Sam and his family are lovely people, and um, to finish, you know, P twelve and to win that Jack Sears uh, in that race three, I think was a monumental effort because. That's where the the more inexperienced people just have a nightmare. Like they just go off and crash usually. So with those changeable conditions, but great to see him um, get that trophy, and, and also great to see him have a, a good race overall as well. And I think you're right. I think that you know once he gets his head around um, the car and stuff, he's going to be he's going to be right there. Um, and I think he'll probably give Ollie Jackson a good run for his money as well. So. Motorbase and the Ford focuses are looking strong when you look at it overall. They could have a really, really good year in, in the different um, categories that they're in, so to speak. So we've had three epic races at Thruxton. Jake Hill leads the Drivers' Championship for the first time in his career in his first weekend as a manufacturer driver. Mark Blundell, motorsports man, is at the top. 46 points to Josh Cook's 45. Jason Plato on 38. Ash Sutton on 36. Dan Camish on 30. And Tom Ingram on 27. Whether we see Dan Camish out at Snetterton or not, we have no idea. We've got six weeks for him to put a deal together. Now, question most impressive driver from the weekend there are so many candidates paul who would you say impressed you the most over the weekend wow what a question that is um do you know what if you were gonna if you were gonna say raw speed (laughs) i'd i'd probably say tom ingram in the in the hyundai i just think he's done an amazing job with the team to get the car there um but i think i have to give it to jake hill if i'm honest because Nobody has given Jake the the due that he deserves to say that he's a title contender. And you cannot say that he isn't. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think that is not the strongest circuit for the for the motorbase um Ford Focus and MB Motors, but I just don't think it is. So I think it's onwards and upwards for him now. And I think maybe that horrendous time that he had at the beginning of last season and then the amazing points haul he had um, you know, from the from from the certain race early on all the way through the end of the season. I think that has done him a massive favour. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Jay Kill because it's too easy to go for silly moves when you're in podium positions and think, oh, I could win this. But he didn't. He just thought, big points, and he's done it, hasn't he? It was pretty spectacular. I mean, race three, that's the best I've ever seen him drive. He said it was the hardest race he's ever done. If only it had stayed dry, just a couple more laps, he would have had a fantastic victory and he'd have an even bigger lead in the championship. But, you know... It would be very easy for us to throw, you know, the star of the weekend to him, not just because he's leading the championship. Obviously, Davos Radio, we support him. I'm going to give a shout out to Ash Sutton just because in race one and two, he was denied. We don't know how well he could have gone, but his fight back, his charge back through the field in both races, coupled with an incredibly smooth and mature run in race three to bag that victory, that's scary for the rest of the opposition. They've got to be thinking that he is on for title number three already. Yeah, I am fully with you. I, like I say, I think it's an, I think it's ominous. I think um, the the only way Ash won't win the title is if 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 he gets involved in other people's accidents. I, I honestly think he is the strongest looking. Yeah. Tim Harvey will probably tell you a different story. He says that you know this isn't a front wheel drive circuit or a rear wheel drive circuit. I'm telling you now, it's not a rear-wheel drive circuit. I really don't mm. think it is. So for him to do what he's done, I think 
I think it just shows how fast he is and that car is. And when they get to these other circuits, I think he's going to have two wins a day like like Josh had at uh, Thruxton. So fingers crossed it isn't a rear-wheel drive washout, um, but I don't think it will be with the strength of the front-wheel drive cars at the minute. So, yeah, it's going to be great to watch, isn't it? It certainly is. Well, we've got another six weeks now until Snedderton. Six weeks until we get to do this again, uh, Paul. But the listeners will be delighted to hear that we are going to start a new feature within the Undercut in the weeks that you're away called Access Paul Areas. This was your choice, by the way, Paul. You came up with this name, so now you're stuck with it. Access Paul Areas. What we want you to do, ladies and gents, is send in your questions uh, to Paul uh, and Over the course of the next few weeks, I'm going to drop a few to you. Send me a WhatsApp message with a nice response. We'll chuck it in. That way you can still be involved in all the shows, but your hectic schedule where you're breaking records and, you know, test driving Mazdas and whatever it is that you're doing, you can still do that, but you're still part of our little show. Is that all right, mate? Are you up for that? I like the sound of it. And Jake, I'll tell you something now, mate. It is going to blow your mind the next thing I've got going on, mate, you don't know about this and no one else does. No, I don't. And it's, and it'll be, and it's bigger than the Guinness world record thing, mate. So yeah. There you you go, ladies and gentlemen, Paul O'Neill is the new stick. There you go. You heard it here first. There you go. (laughs) It's bigger than that. Wow. Okay. You're the next James Bond. Okay. Excellent. Yes. It's going to be really exciting. So uh, the undercut uh, is going to continue over the weeks. Of course, we will still have access Paul areas. Paul will be dropping in from time to time. Uh, We're going to get loads of special guests in from the Toka paddock, loads and loads of people from formula four, from Janetta junior, from the GT five challenge, from super cup, from Porsche Carrera cup, UK, from mini challenge. You're going to get to know loads of people over the course of the next few weeks. We'll end on an interesting prediction. Snedderton, who's going to win race one? What do you reckon? Who's your money on, Paul? I know this is a ridiculous question. We don't know how the cars are going to go at Snedderton. We know nothing. But based on current form and momentum, who would you put your money on? I'm going to go for race one winner will either be Rory Butcher or Gordon Shen. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Me like. Rory's been very quick and Shedden needs a comeback. I, I, yeah. You could see both on the podium very easily, couldn't you? Yeah, definitely. And then I think Row Bottom will have his uh, first ever outright podium. Um, and I think Colin Turkington and um, Colin Turkington will be back in business. And I think Tom Ingram um, is going to be uh, is going to be pretty quick as well. I think that car will work really well um, around around Snetterton. So yeah, they're my they're my top tips, so to speak, fella. Interesting. It's been an amazing second episode. We hope you guys at home have enjoyed it. There's way more to come. And of course, as I mentioned, get your questions in for Access Paul Areas and Paul O'Neill will answer them. Paul, thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed Thruxton. It was absolutely epic. We will see you again uh, in time for Snedderton six weeks from now. But thank you so much, mate. It has been an absolute blast. The usual. Cheers, Jake. It's been awesome, mate. Look forward to the next one. Thank you. Take care, everybody. See you for episode three next week.